So what's going on guys, DIY Dan here, and this is another mechanical video. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I rebuilt this air compressor that I've had for 20 years. This was a Craftsman 30 gallon upright air compressor. So even if you don't have this exact same air compressor, the concept is gonna be pretty much the same no matter the brand or whether it's vertically or horizontally mounted with what I go over in this video. I'm also gonna go over a diagram of how this air compressor works because in order to fix something, you have to understand how it works and go over some diagnostic procedures to help you figure out what might be wrong with your air compressor as well. Now, the reason I'm rebuilding my air compressor is it would not build pressure above 100 PSI and never shut off. I got all my parts to rebuild this air compressor off of Amazon. The main rebuild kit, including the sleeve and the piston ring, was a little over $20. I ended up ordering an air filter housing because I thought it came with the air filter as well, but it didn't. So I ended up buying an additional foam filter and retainer. The retainer didn't end up fitting right, and I'll show you what I did to rectify that. So I've got about $60 into this rebuild. I should have, however, bought this reed valve plate for an additional $40, so I would have had $100 into it. Still a lot cheaper than a three, $400 compressor. And obviously you might not need everything that I actually purchased. And the procedure to rebuild this compressor is really not that big of a deal. So I'm gonna go over how these compressors work in the first part of this video. And then in about five minutes and 15 seconds is gonna be the start of the rebuild of this compressor. So let's get to it. So right here, guys, I've got a basic diagram of the components and I'm gonna go over how these work. This is pretty much the same concept for any oil-free or oiled small shop air compressor. So air is gonna be drawn in through the air filter housing. It can also be called a muffler in this situation. So this is what actually fell out on mine and I didn't realize it, so I ran it for who knows how long without this air filter, which is what led to the demise of my air compressor. Just under the cylinder head, there's a set of reed valve plates that open and close and help control the air coming in and going out of the compressor. So as the piston goes down, in its travel, it actually sucks air through that air filter and down through the intake reed valve. Then as the piston goes back up, it creates positive pressure, pushing it past the other reed valve and out to the tank. Now, the reason for these reed valves is if they weren't there, that air would just push back and forth in here and not really build any air pressure. So we're gonna come through, pressure out, is gonna go through this check valve. The check valve's purpose is to keep the air in the tank and not bleed back through the actual pump. If that check valve goes bad, you will be adding extra load to your motor because there will be extra resistance against the top of the piston. So an easy check to see if this is working is to just take the air line off the top of this check valve when there is air in the tank and make sure you don't have air bleeding back this way. If you have air bleeding back through this line, when obviously the compressor is shut off, then this check valve is bad and that could be your whole problem because putting pressure back against these reed valves is not a good thing at all. If you decide to do this, make sure you take that line off slowly so you can hear the air pressure start to bleed off if that check valve is bad or whether the unloader is not working properly because that line will be under pressure if that's the case. Then we have a line coming out of this check valve that's going to your control valve. This is the unloader line because any residual pressure that's in this line, once as we talked about, could put pressure against these reed valves and start the compressor under load. So when the control valve triggers your compressor to shut off, it also unloads the air pressure in the pressure line and the line between the check valve and the control valve. So your compressor does not start under load. All right guys, so you've got your air compressor plugged into your outlet. Everything as far as what controls this all takes place in this valve. Basically, it reads the air pressure out of the tank right here and tells it what to do. So let's say you've got this switch in the on position and you're anywhere below 90 PSI. Usually 90 to 100 PSI is when they tell these compressors to kick on. So if you're below 100 PSI, it reads that and basically takes the 110 volt and transfers it to the motor to turn this on. Then Depending on what your cutoff pressure is on this one, it's 150 PSI for me. Once it reads that off of this line, it disconnects that power and shuts it to the off position. After the air pressure goes through that control valve, then it comes out through the regulator where you can adjust your air pressure anywhere from zero to 150 PSI. So that's basically how this works. Uh, you got your motor connected to a connecting rod, your piston, this is what creates your pressure. 
There's a little Teflon seal in here that basically is sealing against the cylinder walls. That's what creates your air pressure. There's also a cooling fan here to keep all this cool since it's oil free. These do create quite a bit of heat. Some research I did said these can run up to 180 degrees. So right here guys, you can see that I've got the air compressor running and it just won't build any higher air pressure than this. So basically I could run this thing for a half an hour and it would never shut itself off because it would never get above 100 PSI even though you can't really see it that well. Straight up and down on those gauges is 100 PSI. Now a quick history, you'll notice that I am pulling this little foam filter out. That actually broke on me years ago and I didn't realize it at the time so I actually ran this compressor quite some time I think without that air filter. Which is the reason I'm having to rebuild this air compressor and do this video. So right here I'm just pulling the cover off. There was about three screws that held this together and then they snapped off of each other. There's a good view of the material that had been bypassing past that filter and probably what destroyed my piston ring. At this point I wasn't 100% that it was still going to be my piston ring so what I did is I took the air line off. Then I fired up the air compressor and felt how much air was actually coming directly out of the compressor. It actually felt pretty strong so then I decided to remove the check valve fitting where it goes into the tank to make sure that wasn't stuck open or clogged in any way. So if you're subscribed to my channel, you know I tell you all the dumb stuff I do and this is a good one because this was actually pretty dangerous. I got distracted and I actually had to go do something else and I came back to this project. I had forgot to drain all the air out while I was taking this check valve out. I also ended up breaking this other fitting off of it while I was trying to remove it so that added extra work to my situation as well. Now the whole point to me taking this check valve out is because I was checking to see whether it was bypassing in any way, which obviously it wasn't because there was air pressure in the tank. So that tells us it was holding the pressure in the tank and not letting it bleed back to the compressor. Now obviously I started to hear that air leaking as I was loosening the fitting. I let that bleed off a little bit more than I pulled that check valve out the rest of the way. So I absolutely should have let that drain off completely before pulling it out the rest of the way. That can be dangerous. I was frustrated at the time and impatient. I went ahead and put the airline back on the compressor, put the check valve on the airline and fired it up one more time and felt the volume coming out of the check valve. The check valve was not restricted in any way. It felt like it was flowing good air and that's when I decided to disassemble the head and take a look at the piston ring. I removed the four bolts that held this cylinder head in place and lifted it off of the main body of the compressor. Now when I lifted this off, the cylinder sleeve came out with the head, which might not happen, but irregardless, uh, it might come out in three pieces or all at once. I separated it once I got it out. So here's a good view of the cylinder walls where that piston ring is supposed to seal in order to create pressure. You can see all the scarring. That's why I wasn't being able to produce enough pressure out of the compressor. So there's a good view of the reed valves. You can see how dirty it is in there from me running without that air filter for whoever knows how long. Right here you can see the air filter housing where the air is being drawn in and again how dirty that is as well. Right here I'm removing the single bolt that holds the top of the piston to the bottom so I can remove the piston ring. So my first thought was just to take a wire brush and try and clean up these housings as best I could. However, I thought better of this and decided to take the inlet and outlet reed valves out so I could give them a light sand and then clean up the entire surface of this part of the compressor. When taking out the reed valves, this one had a little cover plate and then the reed valve itself. Now most likely you will be able to see the wear on the reed valves so you know which direction they go. If it seems like that might be difficult, you might want to mark them so you know exactly which direction to put them back in. I used some emery cloth that was 320 grit to lightly sand both sides of this reed valve. Make sure you do not use coarse sandpaper to do this, otherwise you will scratch the reed valves and they probably won't seal very good. I also scraped off any debris that was stuck on the plate that holds the reed valves, then went ahead and set those back in place the same way they came apart and put the bolts back in. This is a very tiny bolt that retains these reed valves, so be careful not to over torque it and snap it off. I did use a small drop of Loctite to help hold this bolt in place. I basically just tightened this thing down by hand with just the socket and then just took my ratchet and went just barely a little bit more with this bolt and called it good. So these reed valves are basically just spring loaded. So all I'm doing here is lightly pushing on them with a little screwdriver and seeing if they look like they're coming back and sealing properly. 
Using a screwdriver, I went ahead and removed the old O-rings off of both sides of that plate and then went ahead and cleaned it and set it aside for now. So in the kit I bought off of Amazon, I had a new sleeve for the compressor, which is basically what's the cylinder walls that got all scratched up. I've got a piston ring and I have the two O-rings for that plate that we just cleaned up. Right here is the old piston ring. It was all torn up, not in very good shape at all. When cleaning any components with brake clean next to this electric motor, make sure it is unplugged for safety reasons. It will completely evaporate off and not be flammable, but when it is wet, it is highly flammable. The other option is to go get some electrical cleaner. They do make that in an aerosol as well. I just didn't have any at the time. Once I had everything clean, I went ahead and took the sleeve out and put it in position over the top of the piston. I was hoping that I could rotate the connecting rod to the top of its stroke and then just set the Teflon seal in place and start the top of the piston and pull it down into the sleeve. That didn't end up working out because the bottom part of the piston has a groove that that seal has to sit down into. And if that doesn't get lined up right, you're gonna ruin your new piston ring. So then what I decided to do is go ahead and take the connecting rod off of the air compressor, install the piston ring on the piston and put it back together that way. There was a single bolt that held the cooling fan to the crankshaft. I removed that and then removed a single bolt to remove the connecting rod from the crankshaft as well. Once getting that off, I decided because this compressor is close to 20 years old, I went ahead and pulled the seal off of the bearing for the connecting rod so I could pack some new grease into it. If you just take a pick and pry up on that rubber seal, it will come up out of there. Then I just grabbed a little grease, put it on the end of my finger and worked it into the bearing. I did that a couple times, moved it around and then went ahead and popped that rubber seal back into place. Now it's time to go ahead and set that new piston ring in place. It sets over the top of the bottom part of the piston. Make sure you put that Teflon ring with the lip facing up, otherwise you will not build any pressure. Then I went ahead and set the cap in place. I did use a little bit of that purple Loctite to hold that bolt in. Blue would also work. Do not use red because everything on this thing is pretty much aluminum. As I tighten that down, I would spin the Teflon seal every once in a while to make sure it's not binding up anywhere. Then I pressed the piston into the sleeve using both hands because it is a very tight fit. It'll probably help to put it at a little bit of an angle to get it started. I don't recommend using any hammers or mallets because you do not want to damage that piston ring. Once you get the piston ring collapsed down into the sleeve, you can set that whole assembly down into the compressor. So to hold this connecting rod assembly onto the motor is just a cinch. So what I mean by a cinch is these two pieces of steel, when the bolt is put in, those collapse and hold it tight against the motor shaft. There's no keyway or nothing like that, and you don't have to worry about any timing as far as where to place this connecting rod assembly onto the motor. It was a little tricky to get this connecting rod assembly onto the motor with the piston assembled into the sleeve, but I don't really see any other way to do it. I did have to use a rubber mallet to help tap the connecting rod assembly back onto the motor shaft. It might also help to lower the piston all the way down to the bottom of the sleeve without fully removing it. That might help give you some more slack to get that started on the motor shaft. Once you get that onto the motor shaft, you can go ahead and put that bolt in place. I did use some Loctite on this as well and tighten that bolt down to cinch that connecting rod assembly down to the motor shaft. Once I tightened that down, I went ahead and held the sleeve down in position and rotated that motor by hand just to make sure everything felt okay and nothing was binding. You will feel the friction of that piston ring against the sleeve. That is normal. The cooling fan is offset to one side where the mounting hole is, so it's pretty obvious which way that goes on. And then you just go ahead and put that bolt back on and tighten it down. And I went ahead and put a little bit of Loctite on that bolt as well just because I didn't want anything coming loose. Once again, I rotated a little bit to make sure nothing was rubbing and everything felt okay. I put the O-ring in the slot on the reed valve plate that seals against the sleeve. That was a little bit of a tight fit and I had to press it in with the tip of my finger to get it in the slot. The O-ring on the other side of the reed plate went much easier. Then I went ahead and did a final cleaning on the actual head. So because I had told you I was missing the actual foam filter out of the air filter housing, 
I ordered a new one, never expecting it not to come with the actual air filter and the cover. So I went to return it and they just gave me back my money because these items were so small. So I ended up using one of the new ones. I did put some silicone around the ceiling area because there was nothing on the previous one. I did use high temp for that. Then I ended up ordering a separate air filter and cover. The cover didn't end up fitting. So I ended up putting a screen around it to retain it with a zip tie. Then I set the valve plate in place with the round O-ring going down and you should be able to see the wear marks to line it up to make sure you have it on correctly. Then I set the head in place and that's just a matter of lining up where the pressure line fits to make sure you have it on the correct direction. I tightened these bolts down in a star pattern and made them pretty snug. There's probably a torque spec but I did not use it. Then I put the pressure line in place and tightened it down. Then all that was left to do was go ahead and hook up the check valve back into the tank and hook up the unloader line and the pressure line coming from the compressor. Now this setup might look a little different than yours because I think about 10 years ago I actually busted off the fitting and had to kind of rig something up to make it work on these lines. For whatever reason I didn't get a video of putting the actual pressure line back onto the tank but that goes right there. Right here I'm just putting both covers back onto the compressor. They just snap together and then the two screws go in from the one side and the one screw goes in on the other and that's about all there is to it guys. Right here you can hear this compressor kick on and I'm showing you that it does get up to 150 PSI. I do think it's taken a little longer than it should and that's because I didn't replace that reed valve plate and if I had it to do over I definitely would have spent the extra money and done it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and it gave you some good information. If so make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already I'd really appreciate it. The whole concept of my channel is to give you guys the most information in the least amount of time as possible so I don't waste your time. And I hope to see you next time. Have a good one. Later.